10 things I didn't learn in school and had to learn the hard way. We're Omniversal. We're looking to get us off of autopilot, listen to the signals that life is sending us. There's sometimes a lot of clues and sometimes we're surprised by them, but the clues were there. We got to pick up on what life is telling us. So I've been asking people um, what you think, especially as adults, if you've been an adult already for a while out of the school system, what are what is something you feel school taught you that that is now useful as an adult? So a lot of times when we're in school, why do we have to learn this? Why do we have to learn that? And and I'm a teacher and I'm, a, I'm an educator and, and I see this from the students and it's a little bit hard to explain to them how this will benefit them in the long run, but at least the basic skills, math, reading, those should be writing, those should be pretty obvious as to why those are useful and those they do teach us. Sometimes what kind of gets, I guess, a little frustrating is, is the formats and so on and so on. But life gives us, I mean, t school gives us the basic um, tools and you have to learn to apply them. And I think one of the reasons it feels like school doesn't teach us this is because they don't make us apply it. So if you're using math, they give us word problems and stuff and you have to solve the math and make the word problems. But they don't actually apply it, like make you do that salt like live out that word problem so if you're trying to find the area for some room maybe they should show you some room or like even use the actual room that you're in you have to do this much excuse me and uh you have to do this much and this much to to get the area of this room or how much are you going to need of this or how much money are you going to need of that and so on and so on so i don't think they make you actually do it and so I, why it, that's why it feels like you've never experienced it and i think we learn the best through experience, through doing. So here are the <clears throat> the 10 things I kind of had to learn the hard way that I didn't feel was a direct, um, directly taught in public school. Number one is finance. A lot of us have trouble with finance and even right out of college, um, my first big check, I, I when I moved out, I tried to stay very under budget because I didn't want to move back home. I wanted to know that I've, that I had essentially made it. I don't, I'm independent. I'm self-sustaining. I don't, I'm not going to need help. So that would probably be one of my biggest, um, ad advice is to stay under budget, at least until you really get a hold of your finances and you really understand it. that that first check can feel like, Oh my God, this is so much more than I've been used to making. But if, you get used to it too quick, then things can kind of pile up and then you're right back to where you started. You need more money and there, there's no really no way of uh, getting more money, at least at that point. So really get to know your budget. How much do you need for, for your house, for your car, for your bills, for your groceries, and then kind of whatever's left over or actually an also should save. So there's also the 50-30 rule. 50% 50 of your earnings should go to uh, necessities, all the things you need. Um, like I mentioned, house, car, bills, groceries, and so on and so on. 30% goes to whatever you want to spend on. And then 20% should go to savings. Now this sounds kind of like a lot. I don't, I'm not even sure if we're doing this much. I'd really have to break it down a little bit and and maybe justify a few that that counts as saving but i think it's best when you're starting off earliest because you're not used to the money so as soon as you get that 20 percent, put it away somewhere else where it's not even going to be you're not even going to be tempted to use it and that should make it a little bit easier uh down down the line okay the before you know it you'll be thinking of retirement and then you're like oh my God, how much have I saved? And then the stuff you <laughs> have used your money on is not stuff that's a uh, long-term, holds its long-term value. It's not going to be a good investment. It's not going to be worth as much anymore. Um, so I think if you follow those, they'll be, that should be pretty helpful. One of the books I just read was called Rich AF by uh, Vivian Tu. She's also uh, a YouTuber and it's... It was very helpful in 
laying out like a blueprint on what to do and and explaining things that we don't understand so i'll leave a a link for it in the in the description so you guys can can check it out next one is insurance they didn't teach us much of this in school at least i don't remember as much and it's mostly the terminology it's once you kind of get it it's pretty easy to understand but things such as premium deductible liability uh, those were kind of things i didn't quite understand so premium is pretty much basically how much the insurance policy is costing you it could be a hundred bucks a month that's your premium and your deductible is pretty much the amount that you have to pay for them for them to pay out i don't know if that makes sense so let's say a car uh, if your deductible is five hundred dollars that means if you get in an accident and the damages to the car are five thousand dollars you first have to pay those five hundred dollars before they pay the rest uh, and also if you had minor damage let's say your deductible is also five hundred dollars and you had something kind of minor and it doesn't reach up those 500 then the insurance doesn't really get involved you pay the 500 and that's that's kind of it there's no there's nothing that the insurance is going to pay you or help you out with if that makes sense liability with insurance is pretty much um at least in car insurance is that you're liable for the other person's car so for example if if you get in a car accident and it was your fault your your insurance is going to cover the damages that you did and so ideally if everyone has at least liability then everyone's car should be covered so if it's your fault you you cover the other person's car your car isn't covered because it's it's liability only and that's what full coverage is full coverage would be covering the other person's car and your car but if you if you get an accident and it was not your fault Ideally, if the other person has liability, then your car is covered and everything is as should be. But that's not always the case. And same goes for other types of insurance, such as renter's insurance. So this is one that I found out. If you're renting like in an apartment, I knew there was such thing as home insurance. But since I don't own the apartment, I was like, is there anything else to protect my stuff? Like in case I get... Um, if my house gets broken into or so on and so on and i don't have to pay for damages to the building since like it wasn't my fault and that's there's such thing as renter's insurance so again there's lots of different types of things and then you have to factor that into your budgeting too now so there's lots of types of insurances and i'm not a big fan of insurances but it is one of those things that sometimes it's better to have and not need than to need and not have it next one is mortgages home maintenance car maintenance so kind of once you kind of uh, once you're kind of out on your own uh what that comes along with so starting with the mortgage buying a home there's the process to it so first you have to be approved for a loan can you afford this house so sure you just got your new job so now usually you have to have a little bit of a of a history uh, how much you've been getting paid so they're not just gonna you, know, you can't just go to the bank and apply for the loan and if you don't have a good record of how much money you're making then they're not they're not going to really trust you like i don't know how, how do we know you're going to repay this loan for us so that's kind of one of the first things when buying buying a house can you afford this house once you've had a, a steady income then they show you okay with the income you're making you can afford a house for this much money and also along with that they usually give you a bigger amount than you're actually than you could probably actually afford whatever it, I, I honestly don't remember the number but um it can be more and so you're you're like oh wow i can afford this much and then you get the house and then you realize that it's probably a bigger chunk than than you were anticipating and so Usually try to stay under and try to see if you can get a gauge as to how much payments are going to be. And even then, different places do it in different ways. It may vary from state to state. But for example, mine, the first time I bought a house, my payments were about $800. And that payment gets split up in, into three ways. It's uh, part to the house 
part two taxes and then part two the home insurance so mine goes through all through the same payment the the bank takes care of all that so they end up paying the taxes at the end and they end up paying my insurance at the end i think there are options to where you can have this separated but if not you can go that's probably the easiest one stop one payment now the part that uh that also the the type of loan i got they said is a fixed fixed interest rate meaning you're already set and my understanding was your your payment isn't going to change so it was 800 some dollars so i'm thinking okay this is going to be my payment for the next 30 years so come the next year and it went up by about 400 dollars. so now it's at like 1200 dollars. i was like what this you told me this was going to be eight hundred dollars and so the part that is a little misleading is that the part that goes to the bank that's the part that stays the same so let's say they split it in half from the 800 the bank was getting 400 for that 200 for taxes 200 for insurance so the part that goes to the bank that's the part that stays the same they're always going to be getting the 400 the other parts the taxes and insurance those are kind of out of their control so that can be if taxes go up then your payment's going to go up and if insurance goes up then your payment's going to go up and so that's how that changed and um, sometimes if you don't have enough so usually it's based on estimates they're going to separate this much for taxes because they won't know how much taxes are coming till the end of the year and if they don't save enough for the following year they try to take that into account and that's where mine came in so mine wasn't enough for that first year so the next year they is is what is called an escrow account that's pretty much where they save all this all this money and they said your escrow account didn't cover it so now we need kind of an advance we need to have at least this much more to put into that account so that your regular payments do cover it and if not then we're just going to shift all your payments and to for you to pay it off little by little so that's pretty much how my payment went up and so uh, now i watch out for it every year make sure my my escrow payment is where it should be or at least a more man manageable position and so now you have the home it's yours and now it's maintenance you're the landlord now so if something goes wrong you have to fix it. If there's plumbing issues, you have to fix it. If there's electrical issues, you have to fix it. It's not like an apartment or a rental home where you don't own it. You can tell the landlord, hey, so so and so this is this is busted, my fire alarm's not working or whatever, then they come and fix it because that's their responsibility. But now if you own the house, that's your responsibility. So I don't know if there would be ways for them to teach you this in school, but uh, again, it's one of those things that it would be nice to have a, at least, a, well, at least more experience, more thoughts are put, put to it, make you think about this a little more. Along now with having your own home and being a little more independent is car maintenance. So uh, taking care of your car, uh, routine maintenance, when are you supposed to get oil changes how often should your brakes last how often do tires last how long for rotating the tires and all that stuff can kind of save you money in the end and it'll prevent car troubles and i think explaining or making you go through these things as to why it's important so if you understand why how or how a car engine works then you would need understand why the oil needs to be changed or why it's so often or the tires also having to be rotated and how they wear and so it at least make you think about it like okay if it's been this long then maybe they're worn out this much and so on and so on so again I think that kind of only comes through experience next one is credit so especially in college so trying to get get us to build up our credit and I remember getting my first credit card in college and that's a terrible place to get or a terrible time in life to get a credit card because college students are usually broke. 
probably have very little finance skills and um and yeah that's just sounds like a recipe for a disaster so i got my first credit card and um i maxed it out and it was hard to keep up with the payments and if i I honestly don't remember that well anymore if i got a second credit card long story short is i got i've maxed out credit cards a total of three times when i was when i was younger and until i reached the point where one of my options was a consolidation loan which pretty much gets all the debt from all those three credit cards puts it into one new loan and gives you a lower interest rate so that was the the perk of it so and then the other perk was that they close out those those accounts so let's say i had the three credit cards and the the interest rate is at probably at least 15 percent, but probably higher so the consolidation loan puts all three of those into one loan and a much lower interest rate probably like five or even eight percent but that's at least now half of what we were doing before they close out your account so you're not even tempted to use them and now you kind of start fresh you pay off pay those off they're they're done and you can start over so i haven't made that mistake since 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 having the consolidation loan so yeah third time's to charm and also again if you read the book rich af it has a lot of tips on bringing down bringing down debt next one is cost of living so for when I first moved out, I didn't know how much things cost. So how much is rent? How much is gas for my car? How much are maintenance things for my car going to be? How much are groceries? How much are my bills going to be? How much are taxes? So all this stuff kind of adds up and it can be a little overwhelming. And that's why I mentioned once you start budgeting, try to really stay under budget until you really have an understanding as to how much you can and can't get away with. And then um, you get you get a little bit of a better idea. The next one is medical insurance. So also this one I honestly don't remember as much when I first got my job, but it's definitely becoming a little more of an issue now. I guess younger because I didn't have not that I have much health issues, but I definitely didn't use medical stuff as much as I do now. And also now being married and having a family is and adding those to the insurance can be trickier or at least now throws in another expense and so that can be a little tricky um so another term that i didn't know with medical insurance was a copay which is almost to me like a deductible it's how much you pay for that service but what's different is like in a car accident you're not planning on getting into a car accident. So, uh, there's no, so that's what the copay is on, on a copay is pretty much more of those planned, um, times you have to go to the doctor when you schedule an appointment, that's what your copay is. So you, you just pay a little chunk and then the insurance is, um, paying the rest of it. And, so that's the difference from a deductible. A deductible would still be if you have to have a procedure and you weren't planning on it, you still have a deductible you have to meet and pay that amount. If it's under that amount, then you pay it on your own and then the rest. And once it is over that amount, then the rest is paid by the insurance. Um, one of the other ones, along with medical insurance, is an HSA and FSA. So an HSA is a health savings account, which from reading the book also rich af mentions that it's a very good thing to have so if your company offers it definitely take it and so what the health savings account is is pretty much you saving money towards that account so it's essentially like insurance or so whatever money you would put towards your insurance let's say your insurance cost 100 bucks you can add 100 bucks to there and this money is only allowed to be used for for health stuff but at least it's not a um, kind of lose it with insurance you're paying monthly but if you don't use your insurance you're pretty much losing it so here it's actually saving up and the thing I just learned from this is that once you the health savings account is for medical stuff but once you reach 65 
then that money is up for grabs. And this money also grows, it's invested. So it's not just dollar for dollar what you put in. So if you've put in $5,000, it's essentially being invested in it or like, like interest, it's growing a little by little. So you're not only gonna get those 5,000 that you put in, you're gonna get 5,000 plus a little more because it's being invested and it's growing. The alternate one is the flex, flexible savings account, which is similar to the health savings account, but it is a more use it or lose it. So the same thing, you can put your amount in there, dollar for dollar. So if you put in a hundred bucks, uh, then you get those hundred bucks, but I think it's an amount for the year. So if you estimate you're gonna use $500 for the year in medical stuff, and that can go towards um, like glasses and, um, contacts and dental stuff so that can be helpful but also if you don't use the full amount then you lose it for the next year and it doesn't grow and or anything so definitely they're usually it's usually kind of one or the other but if they offer you an hsa i would definitely try to take advantage of that so the next one is cost of life events and if you can tell, I'm kind of progressing through my own life here. So now the next thing is a, is a wedding. So how much do weddings cost? And that can vary very much from when, when I got married. So, uh, and that can be also as cheap or as expensive as you make it. There can be some pretty good deals you can get at a, at a local um, uh, party hall. And it can be all inclusive. It includes food and DJ and parking and security and blah, blah, blah. But if not, it can be much more expensive. And kind of sometimes the way we thought of it, it is a big event, a big, big life event, but you're essentially paying for other people. And so, especially sometimes it'll come with pain for possibly people you don't like. So uh, we try to keep it a little more manageable and not as as a uh, lavish or whatever and we also wanted to spend more on the honeymoon that part is for us so uh why not spend on on it more there next one is cars how much do what is the cost of a car so for when we for when i bought my first car i did buy it pretty soon after i got a job i, d I was going to wait but then I did have start start having car trouble, and um, and so I kind of caved pretty easily and got got a got a car, and that's pretty good and all. But also cars, you have to realize what the use of the car is. Is it just from getting you point A to point B? And I wouldn't say again just like the house don't purchase out of your budget you're gonna have this loan for however long i wouldn't say also don't get tempted to make the loan too long because as the car gets older that's kind of what happened to my first car i, I started having trouble with it and I, it wasn't even paid off and so i was like this is my older car took lasted so long and this is the new car and i'm already having slight issues with it and i'm still paying on it so that can be kind of frustrating, especially the longer the loan gets. And also the longer the loan gets. So if you get an eight, so typically a car loan goes from five, six, or seven years. I think the standard is now six, but when I bought my first car, it was five, and now it can go as long as seven. So if you have your car for on the seventh year and it's starting to have issues and you're still paying on it, that, that, that can kind of suck. And so also with uh, when paying for a car is that you kind of like with the with the bank so the bank is obviously making their money first they're getting interest so you barely own the car on with the first few years you start owning the car more towards the last few years and that can be a whole other thing on its own if you don't understand how these loans work but essentially whatever the the bank wants an in interest they're getting most of their interest payment first and then paying for the car. Kind of once their chunk of the interest is paid off, then they start putting the rest of it to the car. So those first few years, you're essentially paying the bank first for letting you borrow the money. 
So if you want to trade in the car after three years and it's a six or seven year loan, you're either halfway or not even halfway. The car, that doesn't mean the car is halfway yours. It's probably barely a quarter of yours. Or to trade it in, you're barely getting even the hardly anything for your car. So your trade in isn't going to be worth that much. Then they got to roll over the rest of the loan from your from that car onto your new one. So there's some tricky some trickiness there. Along with cost of life events is is babies. How how much is this going to cost? How much um, is a baby going to cost? And at first, actually, for us, we were pretty fortunate that uh, it wasn't too expensive. We got a lot of stuff through gifts. We got a lot of clothes through gifts. And the food uh, isn't very expensive. And the, the diapers is probably the most expensive. But... We also had a, a diaper shower, so if if you're having one, I would recommend have your friends see if you can. One of them will throw you a diaper shower, and that one's pretty much where you the the party they just bring you diapers. And I think ours lasted for about nearly a year. And also, if you if they're obviously growing and changing sizes, you can probably take them back to you. You can take them back to the store and just switch out the size. So if you had a a size small and they already outgrew it take it back to target walmart wherever you bought it and they'll and they'll switch out the to the correct size so along with other life events are uh divorces so it can be another another unfortunate thing but another unexpected thing and how can you learn about this pretty much only through experience and one thing i've heard is that it it can be it's up there as one of the most traumatic events along with like a death and also one of the more expensive ones so essentially you think once you getting a divorce you're splitting it into two and from what i've heard is it's essentially splitting it into three because the lawyer is getting that other chunk so both lawyers um help decide what your what each side is getting and so you're essentially getting one third the other person is getting one third and then the lawyers are splitting the the last third so um just be very careful when you're getting into into marriages make sure that this you realize this could be a possibility for for later and uh, another cost of life events is funerals so that's a, a terrible time to have to worry about money and then it's just another kind of lump something that's loaded onto you so there are also options for that you uh, there are cheaper options i think cremation is fairly cheaper but also there are plans to pretty much prepay for this so nobody has to worry about it and that's also what um through your benefits they usually offer a a sort of life life insurance and sometimes it's it's one of the smaller ones where it can just be about ten thousand dollars and that doesn't mean that's what your life is worth but that's essentially more of a funeral cost insurance rather than a full life insurance next one is technology so i'm a older millennial and i did get to have technology in class but if you kind of think about it for a second with uh gen xers i think is that the older one yeah, I think so. Gen Xers, if you, I don't know how much experience you got to do with technology. It might have still been like computers, but they definitely don't do what computers do now. And probably a phone is way more powerful now than what a computer did back then. So for some of the older generation to never have had a lesson on how to do any of this stuff can be kind of scary too that you're, so much technology is coming out. You don't really know how to handle it, but you have to live with it. So, um, yeah, that that can be a hard one to to have to get by and understand without any proper guidance. So, next one is cooking. Cooking. Um, we always have this joke that whenever we go out to eat, there's a long line. It's like, does anybody know how to cook? But the funny part is that we're there also and we know how to cook it's just we're either lazy and so i i 
curious as to why um we go out to eat and what do you guys do you guys go out to eat because you don't know how to cook or because you don't want to cook or you don't want to clean or whatever I, i'm i'd be curious to to know why you guys why you guys go out but either way cooking saves money your groceries you can definitely make way more meals for the amount of money that you spend when you go out and again it's fun to go out every once in a while but to make it part of your budget that's definitely money that can be way better spent and cooking doesn't really have to be is it have to be hard it's pretty as easy or as hard as you make it also if you're but also it's not going to get any easier unless you do it through experience so you gotta you gotta practice it you gotta do you gotta get all those bad meals out of the way that that's not going to get you're not going to get to a good meal without those those bad meals so just kind of push through it and eventually you'll get a little confidence boost where it's like no this isn't too bad and what i made is pretty good and then you don't even have to follow recipes you can just kind of wing it and do it on your own and and it's great all right before i continue into these few last ones if you could take a moment right now and subscribe or like this video if it's been helpful let me know which one of these has been the most um, impactful to you, which one you need the most help on, or which one you had the least education on. But these next few ones are a little bit of my favorite ones, and um, I didn't learn them in college. And so it also got me thinking that if you're leaving only, well, out into the real world with only a high school education, and you already feel like high school didn't prepare you for anything, that that can be a little... A little scary if you kind of think about it so you have to learn all these things on your own through experience and everything so the next one is psychology and sociology so these I liked a lot because it was stuff that I definitely didn't learn in public school or at least not they didn't have its own class you might have learned a little bit here and there social studies and whatever but um, it's very different in college and and Bill Maher had had was mentioning the other day that he's pretty much now diminishing the value of a four-year college which excuse me I can understand it's getting expensive and so on and so on but I, it made me think as to what he well he was mentioning that you could just go into a trade school or just go straight into your craft that you don't need to learn all the basics again and to an extent, I agree, but there was something about college that made you learn it a different way. And so one of the, the psychology and sociology was one of those classes that you were, you were required to take, but I, it, it had nothing to do with my, with my major. So if you guys can answer this one too, what, what classes did you take that were not part of your major that you feel had a had a big impact on your college education or even just the way you like it, it, it shaped you. So psychology pretty much tells us how our brains work and sociology pretty much tells us how all of our brains working together works, what kind of patterns it creates. And so with psychology, you start understanding how your own brain works and then how other people brain works and then how your brains work together and dealing with each other and and uh, working together or not working together and so on and so on so it was fascinating to me and and it's it's still one of the subjects i like a lot now and i still continue to try to learn about psychology and sociology because it's i don't know it just gives you a different perspective as to how how to put yourself in someone else's shoes and why people do the things they do and why we do the things we do and so I thought it was useful. Along with this, a little bit, etiquette and pragmatics. These are respectful behaviors, the accepting of different cultures and being aware. So there's a video I recently saw that how now opposite Gen Zers, the younger generation is having trouble getting jobs and this is after getting college degrees and so on. But then they mentioned a lot of the stuff that's kind of shooting themselves in the foot so if you're a Gen Zer, I'd like I'd like to hear some of this and see if uh, you're you're having issues with this. But some were kind of respectful behaviors, and not that they're necessarily being disrespectful, but it's also not 
the typical norm that um, either you've been used to or taught or not taught. So a few of the ones that they mentioned, like when they're going to the job interviews is, is was lack of eye contact, no eye contact with the, with the interviewer or not dressing, not dressing up for the interview and being a little too upfront with your expectations of it when kind of it's it's kind of opposite you're you're there i guess to make a case for yourself not the other way around they're not making a case for you for them for for you to want them so so it it was very interesting to me to see to see that and maybe i don't know that's an older generation thing and that's something that it's definitely not taught and maybe to an extent it was taught before but it's definitely not taught anymore and you kind of learn a little bit through your teachers like be respectful to your teachers but sometimes what does what does that mean and we need to learn to apply this to keep applying this outside of that situation and the next one is also another one of my favorites is uh kind of going along with psychology and sociology it's one of those more abstract things and it's ethics, religion, and spirituality. Now I understand the reason why they don't teach religion in school, but I think for those of us that want to have religion in school, the reason we don't is because, well, it's kind of hard to keep our opinions to ourselves. And so if you really wanted to teach religion, can we teach religion in schools to the point that you're not bias towards it teach a little bit of all religions and then you get to pick kind of which one fits your lifestyle best and i think that's probably where we have the biggest issues where like oh no well i don't want them picking that one so i want to force this one on them and i think that's pretty much the biggest issue with it if we could handle that then i don't see why we couldn't have something like this back in the classrooms Along with ethics, ethics is also kind of similar, but there's pretty much no right or wrong answer in ethics. And I think that's also part of the issue is that the answers seem very obvious, but also you're not, um, it's, it's still up for debate and they're subjective. And if we can't accept somebody else's decision for whatever they did, that's where we run into problems. We, we think that ethics means this is the only way. And that's that's kind of been the issue with ethics for years is that it's so debatable. And same thing with spirituality. Maybe it's not necessarily a religious per se practice, but it is something that is more abstract and up for interpretation and different people see it in different ways. It has a different shape. And so it's it's going to be hard to. And so if we could accept different opinions and different perspectives, then I think there'd be little reason why we couldn't keep it in school. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, these were the, the top ones that I could think of. And what I'm going to be doing for the next... Uh, few videos if uh let let me know which one has had the hardest has given you the hardest time is see if we can look out for options as to what what could be useful what am i not doing right what what could i do better am i skipping a step and see what our options are for all these what can what are my options for finance can i get myself out of debt what are my options for insurance can i pick a better insurance do i have to be paying this much um same for home maintenance car uh what are our options and it hopefully makes our life a little bit a little bit easier a little bit more manageable a little bit less stressed so thank you for sticking around the full 40 minutes so hopefully you found this useful love to know what you guys need the most help with All right, we'll see you next time. Bye.